seven o'clock or there's someone else coming in now. So just let them in. So there we go. Evening everyone. Thank you for joining us um for this uh talk from the North World Wildlife Trust with myself, Mark Roberts, the membership and events coordinator, and Chris Wynn, senior reserves manager at North Wales Wildlife Trust. As you can see from our pictures, me and Chris are actually sat at Kemlin tonight. It's lovely out there, isn't it, Chris? No wind or any rain or anything. I'm joking. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, thank thanks for joining us. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, I've muted everyone, turned their cameras off, and of those who are in a second ago would have would have heard this because I'm going to record this and I didn't want to inadvertently share your pictures across YouTube afterwards. So um, the chat is open. So if you've got any questions, please put it in the chat and there'll be opportunity to have a chat um, to questions at the end. I may stop Chris throughout, but otherwise, um, let me pass it over to Chris Wynn, who's going to talk about um, our hopes for the summer of 2024 at Kenlin, um, how this may affect the turn Connolly up there and generally what the summer could hold. So you there, Chris? Can you hear me all right? Yeah. Can you hear me, Mark? I can hear you perfectly, yeah. Cool, yeah. Great. All right. Good evening, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us. Yeah, so um, I'm just going to uh, have a look at Kemlin uh, and what we're hoping for this year and take you through some of the things that we, the issues that we deal with every year and some of the new issues, but also, yeah, what we hope to see on the reserve by way of birds. Um. So this is what we're hoping for at Kemlin this year in uh, in 2024. Come sort of late May, early June, a, a good crowd of terns of, of several species all sort of flying around and having a very successful year when it comes to breeding. But uh, we shall uh, keep our fingers crossed for that. Um, what I'll, I'll also going to do just towards the end, I'll just sort of uh, touch on some highlights of birds um, from some of our other reserves and around North Wales and some of the things that we can hope to see and expect to see coming along soon with the spring and summer migration, in, including the barn owls. Okay, so for those of you who don't know, and hopefully most of you will, the Trust has got um, 36 land holdings across North Wales, and Kemlin is over there on the northwest coast of Anglesey. Um, it's been a reserve for just over 60 years now. 50 years, sorry. Um, yeah, um, yeah, uh, and it's internationally renowned and important for one species in particular, uh, and that uh, that is sandwich tern. Um, as you see here, there's a nice example of one here, and really easy to identify from this picture. As you can see, you've got the sort of the small fork tail, um, the black bill with the yellow tip, little black cap as well. Uh, and when you see it with, with other terns in the UK, it's actually quite a lot larger than than them as well so they're really easy to identify amongst terns and they're a lot more graceful than things like black eared gulls and the larger gulls as well so at the moment although we've got a few sandwich terns around the coast of Anglesey um, most of them are probably still making their way back to the UK and some of their other breeding grounds you can see on this uh, map here the the yellow you can see around a lot around Europe and some over in sort of central um or the Middle East over there as well, and some in America. Um, they're the breeding grounds, and the blue is where they, the the terns and sandwich terns in particular spend their their winter, and they're heading back, and they'll sort of be generally around the coast of Spain and France, and heading up to the Channel, particularly the ones that are sort of are coming to the Irish Sea. Um, we know that some of our sandwich terns from Kemlin actually spend part of the summer way down at the very tip of Africa um, in South Africa um, we've had reports of some birds from there birds that we flagged and I'll talk a bit more about what I mean by flagging shortly um, yeah but you see here big colonies of, of wintering birds roosting birds and probably several species there although we can't get close enough to actually try and identify what they are but um, that journey there and back is, uh, is about 20,000 miles in a year which is an incredible journey, uh, particularly when you think uh, a sandwich turn, for example, could live up to 20 years. Um, so that's something like 400,000 miles in a lifetime, which is about that distance to the moon and halfway back. So that's an incredible distance for uh, an animal to migrate over its lifetime. So, yeah, so how do we know that our birds have been down there? Well, um, 
for a couple of years over the last two or three or four with an interruption because of uh, COVID and the pandemic, we were able to both ring and flag our bird. So you can see on the, the left leg of this bird, uh, uh, your standard and classic sort of BTO ring, um, which is very difficult to ring unless you've got your bird in your hand. Uh, but it's also got this little flag, uh, orange flag, um, on its other leg uh, with a special code. So the fact that it's an orange flag and they're very lightweight um, identifies it. The bird is coming from from Kemlin, and this number ident or this these three letters identifies the specific bird. And, and the beauty of these things is they they can be read with a a telescope at a considerable distance. So this allows us to identify individual birds both while they're on the reserve as the summer progresses but later on as they move away including when they get to their summer grounds off the coast of africa which we've had records from several african countries all the way down to south africa but one of the interesting things we've also been able to find out is what the terns do after they've finished breeding at kemlin and other sites um, and one of the key places that people have been able to look um, and these are volunteers is at ross point near Colwyn Bay um, and so you can see here we've got a, a lovely little pie chart that uh, records the sightings of 142 different birds but they were seen a total of 207 times and uh, the combination of sort of colour rings and, and the flags that I've just shown you we we're able to identify where these birds come from so not surprisingly of the birds that were seen with these rings or flags on over a third came from Kemlin. So this information is from 2021. Um, but what's really interesting is where all the other birds came from. So you've got sites around the Irish Sea here. You've got sort of Ladies Island Lake, which is in sort of Southwest Ireland, Hodbarrow in Cumbria. But then you start to get a few other sites sort of up in Scotland, up these two sites here. Um, but then you've also got sites on the Northeast coast of England, places like Coquette and the Farms, which is really interesting. And the, uh, really intriguing question is whether they've flown across country or gone all the way around the British Isles to get to the Irish Sea. Um, but there's also um, at least one, a few birds, I think the fact it says 0% indicates that it's probably just the one bird that's come from Europe. Uh, and then this collection of birds here, Unus Lass, is a number of birds that were ringed as adults um, down towards mid Wales. So it gives you a really good idea of how important sort of the Irish Sea and, and the north coast of, of Wales is for these birds as, as they gather before they head off for the winter. This time of year, we're just getting into sort of uh, finishing up our preparations. And, uh, and there are several really important jobs that we do. So one of which is putting out nest boxes for the terns, um, which are spread over the islands in a variety of patterns. Uh, you can see this uh, one of the the arrangements we've used for several years is in threes like this. So the openings are pointed in different directions, so they're never into the prevailing wind, they're never windy, and there's a gap in the middle as well. Uh, these gaps in the middle often get used by black-headed gulls. I'll, I'll talk a bit more about the importance of black-headed gulls. So you can see this picture on the right here is, is this year on what was actually quite a nice day as we got ready to take the boats out um, full of nest boxes and, and get them all ready for the turns. Chris, going back to that last picture, you said it was a nice day. It was awful as well that day, remember? We had all four seasons in one day, you said. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we were talking about it because I was on the coast path that day as well. No, 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 that was the next day when we finished off. The next oh, okay. day, now, that day was nice all day. And I think it was the day we, um, we put the electric fence out when we had to turn our backs to the hail. Uh, and then it was sunshine, and then it was drizzling. So yeah, but you're right. Kevin is um, you can get quite a lot of weather in one day. It's been a changeable few months, hasn't it? <laughs> it has, yeah. And I'll, I'll yeah, I'll, I'll come on to that in a minute as well. Yeah. So one of our other key jobs is this electric fence that we put up uh, to protect the colony. So we, we've, we've, we had got that out and ready to welcome the terns. And the reason we put this fence up is to try and keep um a few sort of species that can cause disturbance out of the colony and the reason this is important is there was is that there are so few turn colonies now in the uk as a whole and even in the republic of ireland if you consider them all together um, so it's really important that we try and give the turns at these sites that are left the best chance they can that's why we go to sort of considerable efforts to to, to protect them and provide them with the right habitat so the electric fence um 
one species that has been a problem in the past, uh, uh, and it, it might seem a bit unusual, but is, is geese. Uh, this picture here shares some kind of geese. Um, obviously, they're not going to eat anything, but they can just waddle onto the island and roost uh, and cause all manner of disturbance, particularly when the birds are nesting. And we have had issues with that in the past. And that disturbance that happens as a result of that at night, usually, um, gives the opportunity for other predators to come in uh, and just take the very easy pickings. Um, and it's birds like herons that can make the, the opportunity the most of the, an opportunity like that. Um, herons generally like to land in the water the water's edge and walk onto the island. So the fence also helps with them. But um perhaps the main reason for the electric fence is to try and keep uh mammal predators away from the the, the turns and the, the most obvious one and potentially the, the biggest threat is is otters. Um although it's fantastic to see them around the reserve and they have Done or shown a, a remarkable recovery on Anglesey in recent years, and it's one of those really difficult questions in conservation. Is trying to get that balance between a species like the otter, which is protected as well, and the terns. And basically, all we all we try to do is to create a window of opportunity for the terns, where they can get the best chance to get away as many chicks and as many young as possible in any given year. And since we first started using the the fence um, as a result of some issues back in two thousand seventeen. We've not had a problem with otters, so uh, there could be some other reasons behind that. Um, we don't really know, but it, it is working. So the colony has done remarkably well in the last few years when it comes to um, having removed the effects of predation and, and disturbance. Um, the other job that we have to do, when we've just done, is install the the weir uh, and the weir boards. You can see there's a few volunteers here sort of pulling the 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 logs as we call them out into the weir, um, and that's what. What we end up doing is blocking the weir off um, so that it looks like that. Um, you can see some of the boards in that picture actually uh, look very new. And that's thanks to Natural Resources Wales, who were able to fund the purchase of some extra logs um, to help make sure that we can sort of fill in all the gaps right up to the top of the weir. Uh, and the purpose behind this is, is to prevent sort of flooding of the islands. Um, if you go back to sort of 1977, there were two or three occasions when the very temporary structure that was in place at that time uh, collapsed under the sort of conditions we've seen in the last few days, uh, flooded the islands, and uh, by the time we into July, there's lots of eggs and chicks, so the whole colony was um, sort of more or less destroyed. And it was at that point that the, if I just go back a slide, that this weir was built, so that it gives a greater de degree of protection to the colony, and it is very successful. Uh, it prevents the high tides coming into the lagoon and flooding the colony, but it also gives us the means of controlling the water level should we need to. Um, I can't remember where I put my, so, so yeah, so you can see here, so this is water overtopping the weir uh, at a high tide, and we usually get some high tides sort of uh, in early May and late April that can do this, so this is quite a big tide. Um, fairly calmed down, as you can see, but what happens is that we can let the water out quicker so the water level can drop very quickly as well uh, and the reasons we, we sort of allow water in is that the lagoon itself is also critically important a lot of the stuff you, you will never see uh you can see some, some polychaete worms in the in this picture at the bottom which is a, a sieve a, a, of material taken from the bottom of the lagoon um this little diagram that's just come up just gives you an idea of the distribution of some of the animals and there are some very interesting species uh that are very well adapted to the conditions in the lagoon and the important thing about the lagoon is the fluctuating salinity so you get some species like this tiny little snail that are, are very well adapted to the, the fluctuating salinity levels and the combination of salt water coming in and from the sea and fresh water coming from the, the few streams and rivers that flow into the lagoon so as you can see here with this aerial photograph the lagoon it's quite large. It's about sort of 15, 18 hectares or so. Um, a series of small islands where the terns nest and the large shingle ridge. And this just gives you an idea of, uh, sort of how fragile an environment it is, really. Um, the single outlet for the lagoon where we put the, the weir boards in is just here in this corner. Um, it flows through a channel that flows out across the estuary. Um, but yeah, very sort of fragile looking environment. And in particular with, high, with storms, and as we've had for the, 
the last couple of days, and I'm sure those of you who live near the coast have probably experienced your own problems. Um, strong winds and high tides can have a dramatic effect on on the ridge and the lagoon. Um, the ridge itself, I'll talk, talk a bit more about that, is a very dynamic environment because of that. So even in a, a relatively calm winter, you can get a lot of movement of shingle. So um, the last last winter and the last few days in particular, we've seen sort of a lot of flooding around Kelmin. You can see this, this is the, the Western car park flooded at a high tide. Um, so this probably happens through the winter and into the spring. Um, and hopefully it might happen one more time um, in early May. Um, but so it's, it's a fairly regular occurrence. And this picture on the left, looking across the lagoons, was actually taken earlier this week with the high tides. And you can see here that the, the islands are flooded um, here, which has created some issues for us because this, this is really, really unusual. This has never happened in all the time I've, I've been working at Kemlin. Um, and so we'd already got the nest boxes out and the electric fence in place. Uh, and apparently a lot of the nest boxes have been washed off the island already. So we're going to have to take a good look on Friday um, and see what's going on and, and what we can do. But um, some of the other storms over the winter have also created other issues for us. And this is the bridge at the western end. And you can see where the, the, the concrete apron here, the shingle has been eroded underneath it. And we're going to have to have a look at that and see what we can do with that as well. So these changing conditions that we're getting um, with increased storms, but in, the increased ferocity of storm and, and higher sea levels as well are creating all sorts lots of new issues that we've got to try and handle if we want to make sure that Kemlin is a great place for turns to nest and breed going forward into the future. So here's a, the ridge on a slightly calmer day, and it is a, an entirely natural feature which responds to the changing uh, ferocity of the storms and, and, and the height of the tide. And uh, if you take a walk along the, the ridge, it's, it's a mixture of all sorts of stones from many locations around the ROC. And this this high dynamic environment um, is important for quite a number of species that are particularly well adapted. And at Kemlin at the moment, um, the sea kale, this plant has, has come up on the left here, and won't be looking like this at all. This will be sort of midsummer, and all we can see at the moment is the stumps of the, the roots of the plant that have been exposed by the shingle, but also plants that are just popping up through the shingle where they sort of try and get some green out and, and get some sunlight. So Sea kale has very deep roots that go right down in, into the, the shingle and down to the soil at the bottom. But then you get species like you can see here, like this the yellow flowering yellow horn poppy, which we probably won't see for a, a few more weeks yet, but they sort of are an annual plant that just make the most of opportunities in the disturbed and very open ground. And, and you get things like sea camping as well. And their roots are very close to the surface and they make the most of the very sort of thin soils that exist between the, the stones to spread their roots out and just try and get some some water and likewise um sea thrift tends to be found on the in the slightly more established areas of grassland on the ridge and, and generally around the coastline so one of the things that we've done on the island, island in the last few years is to create some new habitat for um for sandwich terns and for the terns to breed so this area was created about four years ago and is now a particularly popular spot for uh young birds and so we get crashes of young sandwich terns that occupy this area at the moment there are some birds at kemlin um in particular well, one of the things we've gotten we're sort of really pleased to see back is uh some mediterranean gulls you see them um, here much darker head than uh black headed gulls and i'll, I'll talk a bit more about black headed gulls in a moment as well um, but also one of the really nice sights to see um at the moment at Kemlin is the big flock of golden plover. Uh, several hundred birds on some days, and you can see here the uh, the plumage in particular in the sunlight can be look really, really amazing. But uh, another returning uh, visitor that we have is our wardens, who will be starting on Friday. And I'm pleased to say that Mark and Hannah will be coming back uh, and getting things up and running. They'll be there to talk to, to visitors through the summer and tell them what's going on with the birds. Um, and other, other wildlife around the, the reserve as well. So, as I mentioned, black-headed gulls, these have been around all winter. And unfortunately, I mean, I'm not quite sure how they're going to respond to sort of the flooding that's recently happened, because they would be thinking about nesting and making nests. But I think they're quite resilient birds, and they probably will just start over again and get on with it. But they're 
Black eagles are really important for the terns because they're quite an aggressive bird and they will defend their nests from aerial predators uh, and just mob them. Um, and in particular, sandwich terns who generally do like to nest with black eagles gulls because they're not quite as aggressive. As I said, we've got some sandwich terns at the moment. I think the last report I had there was about 100 birds around and we're hoping that numbers will build up over the next few weeks. Um, last year, um, numbers weren't as high as they have been. I'll, I'll come back to talk about how the numbers have fluctuated. But yeah, we're still hoping for the birds to return. Generally, what we see is that during the day, the numbers to slowly creep up, but at night it can peak very, a, a lot more quickly and we'll see several hundred birds at night roosting and then the numbers go down during the day and until we get into sort of like early May when they sort of settle down during the day. So and it won't be for a few more weeks yet that we will see Arctic terns and, and, and common terns as well, but hopefully we'll get some of those returning. And who knows, this year could be a year when we get a, a roseate tern breeding once more at Kemlin. We've not had one for, or we've not had a definite one for a good many years. And last year was a fairly quiet year for roseate terns at Kemlin. The year before, on the other hand, was very good. And we had at least one pair that looked like they could possibly be nesting. So if you were out doing a bird survey when you were trying to decide whether a bird was definitely breeding, possibly breeding, or probably breeding, breeding the number of times that rose, this pair of roseate terns were soon seen, you would probably would have gone for a possible but it was very difficult to tell and there was no sign of chicks later on. But last year was, a, uh, or 2021 was, a, yeah, perhaps a, a difficult year for them, but never mind. We shall see. But the other thing this, this picture very well illustrates is food. And one of the things that we'll be hoping to do this year is to look again at what the birds are feeding on, get some idea of the range of prey that they, that they will be eating and taking this sand, um, sandwich turn you can see them on sand deals that's their favorite food but they will take other things as well and so just getting an idea of how the food changes and, and the availability of food and what the size of prey that they're coming in can tell us how well the, the birds are doing and what the availability of food is like out in the Irish Sea particularly in combination with the work that goes on on some of the other turn colonies both around Anglesey and other locations in the Irish Sea but we'll also be keeping an eye on what other things feed on as well in particular our lovely friends the, the herring gulls, and here you can see the, well, I won't dwell on that picture. Um, so herring gulls are one of the key species that can be very troublesome for the, the terns there. can be quite um, hard for the birds to deter, and they will take uh, chicks up to a side, but this one, the bottom right, just seems to have a bit of a handful there. there so. This is one of the other things that the wards do keep a close eye on, and where we can, we try and disturb the birds and prevent them from predating the the eggs and the chicks there are a number of other things that we keep an eye out for and thankfully most of these haven't been problems for many years but we have had issues in the past mink um don't seem to be an issue at the moment but we'll be keep a very watchful eye out for them uh and in, in the wider context of the island we are working with a range of other organizations to to look at mink across the island and they can not only be a problem for seabirds coastal seabirds like terns, but other ground nesting birds, birds like waders as well, um, but also for water voles elsewhere on Anglesey. Um, stoats and mink have been a problem in the past and we, we just keep a, a close eye on monitoring them, but they haven't been for many years. Uh, I mentioned otter already, so uh, they, the last time they were a serious problem was 2017, when uh, a small family caused an, a lot of disturbance. We don't think they predated many, but they just caused a disturbance, and that was sufficient to put the put the turns off, particularly in combination of, of the the predation that occurred as a result of the disturbance caused by the otters. A whole range of species were able to sort of predate eggs and chicks. Um, so, you like I say, we keep a watchful eye out, looking for signs. Most of it is signs, um, sprang particularly of the of the otters and and, and, and mink as well. But having all these birds together in one space, talking of food, and, you know, and that's what all these are, the mammals and the birds are all after is food. It does give us an opportunity to look at some really interesting behaviour between the terns. Um, and we often have students looking at um, some of this behaviour. And one of the, the key things that they look at is something called kleptoparasitism. And here you can see a, a picture by David Woods, which, which caught really caught it right in the actor. Black-headed girls in particular do like to try and steal food from um, the terns. 
hence the the name kleptoparasitism. Um, but there's an interesting, almost like an arms race that goes on between the species, where the terns will show off and sort of fly around, zigzag, and try and put the the black-headed gulls off, um, trying to steal their food. And and mostly the the black-headed gulls aren't successful. Every so often they are, and uh, that makes it worth their while. So that's just another aspect of the, some of the research and monitoring work that we do at Kemlin. Well, the other things we're, we're aiming to look at this year with, with uh, the wardens and some of our volunteer help is looking at the use of the nest boxes. Um, it's generally thought that it tends to be the boxes themselves are favoured by roseate terns. Obviously, we don't get many roseate terns, but they're also great for shelter for chicks as well, both in, in bad weather, but also um, from aerial predators. And one of the other things that we'll be hoping to do this year, as usual, excuse me, is our usual monitoring of the colony to give us an idea of how well the colony is doing. And if you look closely in the sort of, whoops, sorry, in this bottom of this picture, you can see um, some sandwich turn eggs there. Um, it's, it's member staff here, Ben, just going around counting the eggs and the nests. And this just gives us an idea of how well the colony is done. This work is all done under a license from Natural Resources Wales, which allows us to go out on the island. And we, we do this work as quickly as possible because obviously we don't want to disturb the, the birds for too long. Uh, and we do record how well the birds respond and they do settle down within sort of a, a few minutes after us going, they start to come back. So um, it is something we're very, very conscious of. But the information that we get out of this work is really important to understanding how well the colony is doing, but also how well um, bird, the, the seabirds are doing in the RSC as a whole. The sort of information that we're able to collect from this allows us to, to get this sort of table. So that this just shows the number of breeding pairs of sandwich terns over the years at Kemlin. You can see it fluctuates, and that's the sort of thing that you'd expect from any large population of birds or any other mammals. It fluctuates from year to year as a, as a as response to all sorts of environmental conditions, including things like disturbance and predation. See uh, what's been happening in the last few years. We sort of hit a, a, a recent peak there of just over 2,000 pairs, about 2,200 pairs. But last year, we had this sort of drop um, down to about 1,000. Um, and we're not really sure why, and I'll come on to talk a bit in a moment about the most likely reason. So you, you can see how the numbers fluctuate. So going back a few years, so one of the interesting things here is in 2017, where I've talked about this problem with, with um, the otters, we, we get quite a lot of turns nesting. But what this sort of graph doesn't show you is how well the birds bred. And what happened that year is despite the fact there were 2,000 bears, pairs of birds, there was no successful fledging or young at all. So productivity was zero. And possibly as a result of the level of disturbance that year, the following year, we only had just over 500 pairs of sandwich turns nested. But they soon recovered as we put in place some of the measures that I've talked about earlier on to try and protect the birds from disturbance. Uh, and they sort of climbed up again. Um, they have since suffered another um, fall. So in a good year, we can have about 20% of the UK population of sandwich terns. That's sort of one of these years up here. Just to give you an idea of how um, Kemlin relates to some of the other um, Irish sea populations in particular, um, this graph sort of shows at the bottom, you've got Kemlin. Again, similar fluctuations as we've shown before. But this yellow dot show the overall Irish sea population. And what you can see here is the significant contribution that Kemlin makes to the Irish sea population, um, but also <clears throat> how the, the fluctuations overall are sort of mimicked by what's happening at Kemlin as well, uh, which gives an indication that there was perhaps some over overarching environmental conditions and variables that may affect all breeding populations. But one thing we do know, as I've sort of hinted at earlier when we were talking about the flags, is the way the birds will move from one colony to the other from year to year. Uh, and often if we lose some birds, so to speak, they, they might turn up at uh, another colony like Hodborough or Ladies Island Lake, and likewise, and vice versa. If they don't have a good year, we might see uh, an increase in our population. <clears throat> but uh, last year, we had a, a, a really big issue that arose, and, and, and in, we experienced it for the first time in, in North Wales 
uh, last year, although it hits seabird colonies around the UK and elsewhere in Europe in the previous year. And that was an outbreak of um, bird flu. Uh, and this is, I think, might underlie the reason why we had such a small, well, not small, a lower population of sandwich terns at Kemlin. Uh, we sort of think that perhaps the, the wintering populations may have been badly affected by bird flu as well. So the number of birds returning was lower than what we might expect. Um, none of the other colonies in the Irish Sea saw an increase anywhere approaching the number of birds that, that were missing from Kemlin. Um, so it, it, as the sort of season progresses this year, we are sort of a little bit anxious about the number of birds that might return, but all we can do is wait and see, really. Um, and hopefully um, Mark won't end up having to dress like this to uh, remove some, some dead birds. Um, it's a, it's a, <clears throat> obviously a serious issue for us to deal with, and we will, we're working with a whole range of other agencies to make sure that we have a coordinated response and understand the movement of the disease around the various populations and to keep us sort of abreast of what's happening both in North Wales and the, and the Turn Colonies, but also across Wales uh, and the UK as a whole as well. It's still possible to report. Oh, I'll come back to that, sorry. Um, but just to give you an idea of what happened last year at Kemlin and how it sort of varied with the, between the different species. You see here, <clears throat> we've got some nice graphs. So the blue lines are the breeding populations. This is the total breeding population, not breeding pairs. So we had about 1,000 pairs of sandwich terns. That's about 2,000 birds. Um, 170 uh, common terns, 140. Arctic and 480 black eagles. And uh, um, in this graph, I've used breeding population just as a reference point to give you an indication of, of what happened. So the, the sort of slightly gray purple color is the number of eggs that each um, species produced. <clears throat> As you can see, it's some it's a bit less than one per, a bit less than two, you know, one per nest for the um, sandwich terns and then about one per nest for the other species. Um, but if you look at how the disease impacted on the different species, there's a very um, different picture emerges. So you see, so the, the sort of orangey colour um, is the number of dead adults that we found um, throughout the season. So relatively speaking, the impact on the sandwich terns was quite low. But the impact on common terns was considerable. So that's you know, over 50% of the breeding population of adults. Um, were lost to bird flu, uh, and about a third of the Arctic terns, and again, a, a, a smaller proportion of the black headed gulls. So, in terms of the impact on the adult population, the, the most concerning is the common and Arctic, really. Um, and in terms of, sort of the, the future sort of breeding success and the future populations that are coming. Um, but then, if you look at um, the impact on the chicks, the, a, a different picture emerges in that there was a much more significant impact on the chicks of sandwich terns uh, compared to the Arctic and common terns and even to the black eared gulls as well. So they lost quite a, a, a large proportion of last year's uh, young as to, to bird flu, but hopefully the, those that did survive will be a little bit more resilient to the disease. Uh, and like I say, we sort of wait somewhat anxiously for the outcomes um, and, and what bird will return this year. Um, this is... Um, some information uh, that I got from a DEFRA database, um, just to give you an indication of that, from last year of how widespread bird flu was. And the, the more intense the color, the redder it gets, the um, the greater number of, of, of findings of, of corpses that were attributed to the bird flu. And you can see on Anglesey, um, it was sort of the turn colonies, uh, and this one period was Kemlin, but you've also got the, the northeastern turn colonies, which were particularly badly affected in 2022 as well. Yeah, so uh, as I saw into earlier, you can still report any dead birds that you found. Uh, and if you visit the NRW website or the DEFRA website, you can find out what the lightest guidance is. Um, I have heard recently that the, the, the situation and the uh, alert levels for wild birds and for captive birds has been decreased to, to low. So at the moment, uh, it's nowhere near, we're not in the same situation that we were at this point last year, so which is, which is good news. And as we're keeping our fingers and wings crossed for the terms for, for 2024. 
and hopefully this is what we'll be be looking at come so like I said late May uh, July time just to, it's, I think it's always worth just wondering how we managed to do all this work and how it's always funded so um, we're very lucky that we over the years we benefited from a, a, a legacy but we've also had European funding had funding more locally from the Anglesey area of outstanding natural beauty from natural re resources Wales, as I've mentioned. Um, but also, you know, one of the key things for us is really is time and materials from both our members, but also volunteers who help help us set up, as I've shown with the pictures, but also help with the warning and talking to people and, you know, getting people excited about the natural world, which is really, really important. Um, and this is just some of the ways that you can help support us. Um, and if you, you know, you can find out a lot more about all of these on, on our website and the will be um there'll be plenty of ways to get involved and if you want to help um at Kemlin just have a look on our website. But one of the things that we are looking forward to this year is uh what might turn up. Excuse the pun, sorry about that. Um last year some of you might know um we had a pair of Avocet um who did nest and unfortunately the the, the chicks didn't survive and we don't know whether that was down to bird flu or or whether it was another reason we, we never actually found there any corpses at all but they did breed successfully just uh they were the they, the young didn't survive and that was the first breeding record for avocet ever on anglesey um so that was amazing that was really exciting fantastic bird to see very distinctive um so it, who knows they might come back this year um one of the other exciting things was a, a ring plover, and um, much more common along the Anglesey coast. And you can see them in a number of locations, and they've always been around at Kemlin, um, as this photo by Ruth shows. Um, the really good news last year was they actually bred on the ridge for the first time in in many many years. Um, and I think this just is just an indication of how successful uh, the management of the visitors to the, the reserve has been. And in particular, you know, are just talking to people about keeping their dogs on a lead. It's, it's that sort of disturbance that can, can put, put ring plover off and, and, and oyster catchers as well. We also used to, to to breed on the on the ridge. Interesting enough, at the back of this photo, you can just about make it out. There's a turnstone. Um, they don't breed, but they they are present sort of at various points during the year. So, fingers crossed this year as well that we'll, we'll have ring plover returning on the um, on the ridge. And who knows um, what else we might see. Um, this is taken from, I think this was 2022, when we had an elegant turn. It's a North American species. Uh, uh, popped up at Kemlin and stayed around for uh, a good few weeks. Uh, so lots of people were able to see it. Um, and it was very easy to see because it was quite a showy bird, like the stand as it is here on the boxes and on the bricks um, and make a lot of noise. Um, so yeah, um, a little bit larger than the a sandwich turn but quite closely related to sandwich turn but this bright yellow bill meant that it stood out quite well amongst the other turns Chris, so you yep. said that that elegant turn came from north america so how would it have ended up at kemlin it's just winds you know like as we've seen today you know over the last few days there have been strong winds i think of yesterday all the, the really damaging winds were all northerlies and they've shifted around a bit at the moment to have been more southerly. So if you get strong southerlies, you can push, you know, all sorts of migrants our way a bit quicker than they might come, and even birds that might not normally come this way. But whereas if you get a westerly that's coming over from across the Atlantic, they, that can push birds over, um, and, you know, sort of bird watchers can come flocking to see them. So, But I think this particular elegant turn had been around a while. Um, and I think it, it moved on elsewhere, and it, was, it might have been the same bird that was seen a number of locations around sort of uh, the UK um, in, I think it was 2022. Um, and it's the same reason we get other turns turning up. It's hard not to make that pun. Um, but yeah, so the this time of year, we're expecting a whole range of migrants and just to maybe just pick up on a, a few other species that we might be sort of hoping to see around some of our other reserves and some other locations in North Wales. And, and I know a favourite of quite a few people is the, is the lovely, beautiful little pied flycatcher and then he's a male here um and some good places to see that we've got a few reserves where it's really easy to see them places like Gwythe Power down at Penny Day Drive um really interesting place to visit 
for reasons other than wildlife, as a, it's a form of exploded works, well worth a visit. We're also down to uh, our Celtic rainforest at, at Cloyd Crabnant, which is another great place to, to see them. An amazing site for bryophytes and lichens. But also uh, over in the east, you've got places like Cloyd Kilogrois Fluid, um, one of our woodlands over there. And what's interesting here is that in all of those locations, we have, a, we have teams of volunteers who are checking nest boxes, as it shows in this picture, um, and checking the breeding success of the birds and checking how they're doing um, and, and ringing the chicks as well. And being able to compare that data with other sites, other locations around the whole of the UK, um, once the information has all been pulled together and collated, it is really interesting. You can tell you how birds are responding to the changing climate and changing weather that we get from year to year. Uh, my picture back at the, the beginning of the, of the barn owls, it were, you know, sort of this time of year, barn owls are probably just starting to be nesting. They might, they've probably got eggs by now, but there was, you know, you're still seeing them around and, and hunting uh, at dusk. Um, and we have a couple of our reserves where we, we hope that uh, barn owls will be, at least if not seen, hopefully breeding. And of course, um, as we get into the spring proper, you know, we're hoping for the return of the, the swifts and the swallows and the house martins. I think there's been, I was talking to Ben Stammers, who's our swift project officer. There's been a, a couple of sightings already of swifts and uh, swallows and house martins have definitely been seen around. Um, but obviously one of the big um, stories at the moment is, is the returning ospreys. And, uh, and Mark was just filling me in with what's happening at uh, um, Tim Brennig, where we've got a, a nest site there. Uh, and, and an intriguing story of uh, males returning and the females turning and not being the same one as last year, and all sorts of sh shenanigans and soap opera stuff. There's stories. all sorts There's, going on at there. I'm the sure. <laughs> if you want to find out a bit more about that, if you look on our, our Facebook page and follow the, the Brennig Osprey Project, you can uh, keep up to date on uh, the whole story there and what's going on through the, through the season. Uh, and talking of uh, Tim Brennig and uh, our big Upland Heathland Nature Reserve there, uh, Rossman Fluid, one of the other species that uh, are starting to sort of show off at the moment is um, black grouse. Um, and we do have a, a, a little sort of event, a survey event coming up in the near future um, where um, one of our reserves obviously will be going up there quite early in the morning for those who like to get up at the crack of dawn um, to try and find uh, some black grouse legs. Uh, and if, like I say, if you check our website out, um, you can find out a bit more detail about that. But yeah, the, the, there's also some exciting stuff for the trust. You know, we've, we've got all these things that which we know might be happening, like, you know, the ospreys returning um, and the pied flycatchers. But uh, on our newest acquisition, Brynir Van, you know, we, it's very new to us. It's, it's literally a year old almost, I think, within a matter of a few days. And we're sort of just still discovering and learning about the place. Um, so this is a view of the top. It's, it's the only site where we've got a mountain top, our only bit of land. So this is at the top of Bulk Marrow, you can see over here in the in the middle distance. Um, fantastic, amazing place with a scree running down the hill to the, the, the lower valley and the sort of upland heathland habitat. But um, ideal place for species like Skylark and Curly as well. So that, you know, this spring and summer, one thing we're going to be looking at is how these birds are doing around this area of land and whether they're actually nesting. We're definitely sure that Skylark there from the visits we made sort of early last year. And we're hoping that perhaps Curlew might be around as well. So some exciting things work going on, just trying to discover and find out a bit more about Brynivan as well. Chris, um, I'll never forget your description of Brynivan the first time you went up there and you said you were like you were walking up and then you climbed over a wall and it was like, oh, and there's more to go. Oh. There's even more. Yeah. Then you climbed over another one. Oh, we've got to go even yeah. further. <laughs> yeah, I think yeah. Particularly if you come up, there's a there's a public footpath that cuts across the slope of people. If you come up this way, as you head up, you, you you sort of crest one ridge and you think it's the summit. It's not, and then you crest another one, and, and you just keep going up and up and up until you get to the top. And then, as you can see on on a day like this, the the view is amazing. You know, it's it feels like you're at a pivotal point in Wales. You know, you can look across here to Anglesey, across to Aruri. Down to Cadaridris and then down all the way down the mid Wales and down Pantheline as well. You know, it just feels like a real pivotal place. And what's the um, on a nice day? What's the acreage, it's, Chris? What's it, or is it hectares, um, overall? It? It's 174 hectares so it's overall. So, this bit here in itself is something like 70 or 80 hectares, which is massive, you know, compared to our other reserves. Yeah, so it's a really big site. And, and because of that, it's really exciting. You know, there's all sorts of things going on that we're really keen and excited about. Uh, and I'm, I'm embarrassed to say I've not got there yet. 
Yeah, we'll get you there. <laughs> well, I, I broke I broke down on the on the staff day we were had there. Oh, right. get there. <laughs> so I just I've driven past multiple times, and every time you go down towards Fourth Maddock, it just rises on that right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Driving down, yeah. isn't it? I'm just not. And I suppose we we should make a plug for our bio blitz in the in the summer. Um, I'll put I'll send everyone a link to that. Yeah, the, like, check out our same. website for details, so that'll be a yeah. chance to get involved in all sorts of. Uh, Surveys and, uh, and there are a couple of things in the chat, but very relevant. Richard Boswell's asking, "What's the mountain called again?" Um, it's called Bulk Mower, which is strange because a bulk isn't a mountain; a bulk is a pass. So that's the bulk there. So, he's, uh, um, but yeah, and, and the actual summits haven't got proper names. Maybe we should name them. <laughs> yeah, Bulk Mower. So, um, off a bit further. Hold on, I can never get my bearings. That sort of westerly-ish, southwesterly-ish because it, it arcs round to Eel Ival and sort of along there, so yeah. Really prominent set of mountains as you head down to Portsmouth if you look off to the, the west. Uh, so yeah, so there's excitement there looking for Skylarks and Curlew and who knows what else. But yeah, just to go back to Kemlin, if you're if you're sat at home on a rainy day and you want to find out a bit more about Kemlin, we have got this um, nice infogra infographic. Um, this one I've got here isn't live, but these little dots... I mean, you can click on them and find a little bit more information about the different species and a bit about the weir as well. But there's also a whole load of other information on Kemlin, including a bit about the history, if you're interested in uh, um, the story going back to sort of the before the Second World War, about the history of Kemlin and Captain Vivian Hewitt. He was a very interesting character. And that's all on our website as well. And we'll be keeping uh, our website up to date with news from Kemlin through the summer uh, with a sort of weekly updates on what's around and what's going on and how things are doing yeah so that's it from me um and if there's any questions i'm i've just put that link to the camlin reserve chris with all the stuff on in the um in the chat for everyone so they yeah. can just call it when at their yeah. own convenience so um going back to the bird flu bit christine was asking is that some sort of scale of the vulnerability of the various seabirds to bird flu or is it or is there a habitat connection, perhaps. Um, sorry, Mark, I missed part of that question because just as you said it, a large truck went past my window. Yeah. Oh, well, I actually thought it might have been the fact that my four year old was running past mine at the same time as well. So it could have been either. So, sorry, sorry, yeah, sorry, sorry. can you repeat the question? So, yeah, is there some sort of scale of the vulnerability of the various seabirds to bird flu, or is there perhaps a habitat connection, perhaps? Well, I think one of the issues for, for terns and for any colonial. It's it's colonial birds, you know. They you know they're they're, they're living in among the you know. There's I don't know, last year even with a slightly reduced population, the, you, you'd be talking somewhere in the region of three thousand birds on the islands, which you know aren't much bigger than you know a football pitch, you know. And that's a lot of birds doing a lot of moving around and just stepping in each other's waist and everything. And particularly when the chicks are born, the chicks are even more mobile than the adults within the colony. And and so if it is there, that probably doesn't help them at all. Um, so colonial birds like that seems to be the ones that are really badly affected. So like other examples of the gannets um, from places like Bass Rock. And it almost seems like the, the bigger the colony, the worse it is. And there, it's a known effect with, with, uh, with seabirds in particular, the nesting colonies, that as they get bigger and bigger, you almost get this point where it's not a good idea to be in such a big colony because the spread of diseases other than bird flu happens, you know, an animal dies and the animal gets trodden on. So there's like a, it's a constant balance as the, as the population fluctuates between they're being really big and then coming down a bit, you know, other than, you know, where it might crash for other reasons. So it is a, it's, it's, it's a fine balance really, I think. And I think for the colonial birds, um, they're very, very obvious when they're affected because you, you can see them. Um, and it, it's that fact that they are colonial is one of the key things. And one of the things that's not really clear with bird flu is, is how birds that tend to nest in isolation, how badly they were affected. So if you, know, if you think of something like, I don't know, a blackbird or a blue tit that's nesting in a tree, if that got bird flu, it just falls out the tree, falls on the ground, no one's going to see it. Whereas if you've got a big seabird colony like this, they're very, very obvious. Um, so And there's quite, a, I think it's, it's sort of several tens of different species have been affected but most of those are sort of larger species that are easy to spot okay. and now you know, it yeah. has been recorded in um, seals and foxes as well okay. and that they think is a result of the them sort of feeding on carcasses 
um, so it's transmitted it that way. So it's just another way of the disease spreading. No, but yeah, yeah, interesting, interesting question. Thanks. Yeah, so yeah, an interesting few years ahead then, isn't it? Obviously, because yeah. we haven't, we, you know, we, we, it's, we won't know the probably some of the effects until further down the line, will we? Mm. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. So um, something I was just I was going to ask um, was, uh, do you still have problems with the peregrines up there? Um. Yeah, we do. Yep. I think um, it's always an interesting thing when you think about predators, because obviously predation of any species is, is a natural thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and it does occur. And so one of the things that we try and observe and record is the is the level of predation. Um, I think the things with, with peregrines, it's very visible again, what they do. And it's not so much the predation that they cause, which is might be just a handful of adults because again as i was saying about kleptoparasitism they're not very successful <laughs> thankfully um so if they come and take one bird and they tend to you know often they'll pick out a young bird or one that looks a bit sick and it, that's fine it's not so much that if they do that if they catch one and take it away that's fine you know the birds will settle down but it's if they ever take a bird and land on the island the level of disturbance that causes Excuse me, it's very significant. Um, and it's going back to um, 2020 and COVID year. Um, it was peregrines that were behind the reason that the colony on the Skerries abandoned. Um, and that wasn't probably down to any predation. It was more the disturbance. A, a pair of birds just took up residence on the island. They didn't nest there. And so as the turns, and this was early in the spring, as the turns were arriving, you've got two peregrines flying around and no right thinking bird is going to hang around while you've got two very, very effective predators are flying about. So lots of those birds moved to Kemley and that's why we had such a peak of Arctic and common terns in um, 2020 at Kemley. So yeah, so and that's disturbance. So I think it's really important that when you think about any predator, you not only think about the predation, you think about the disturbance that they can cause as well, because that disturbance that gives other species opportunities. And if you start thinking about disturbance, that's when you start thinking about people and dogs, you know, so that's the key thing. And disturbance, frequent disturbance, and whether you're thinking about nesting seabirds or roosting birds and places like Trifladan just down the road from our office in, in Bangor and elsewhere, you know, that the constant disturbance is just bad news for animals that are trying to survive and trying to eke out a living and feeding in a, you know, in, in, a, in an increasingly harsh and difficult environment. Yeah, it's one of one of the key roles that the volunteers play, isn't it? it it's just educate and uh, yeah, the board. Yeah, just talking to people. Yeah, educating just, people, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, just talking to people. Yeah, yeah, and people yeah. really, really keen to hear. Yeah, uh, Roberta said in chat, "Thank you, Chris. Very interesting. Let's hope this year is better, uh, better breeding success." Uh, Christine yeah. says, "Thank you." Um, I don't know if there's going to be any more questions coming through. Um, if you Anything you do want to ask about this, I will send you a follow-on email anyway with a link to the talk and all the links that Chris has mentioned today. And if there's anything you want to know, you, you're more than welcome to reply to me in that email and I'll pass it on to Chris. Um, unless he's got hundreds of them and I, I won't pass them all on and let him do do, do do his work since you since you are responsible for all 36, 35 reserves and 36 land areas. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, uh, and John's also said thank you for... An interesting talk and Sally says thank you very well delivered. Okay. So, no, but thank you all for joining us. The only reason we put these talks on is because um people like yourselves seem to enjoy them. You want to know the work we're doing and you know thank you for your continued support. We couldn't do an awful lot of this work without your support, whether that's as a member, you know, as a volunteer or just 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 being supportive of the work we do across North Wales. So thank you. Anything else you want to add, Chris, or should I leave it there? <laughs> no, um you can leave it there. No, I don't think to add, but maybe uh, either our wardens or even maybe myself will see you out at Kemling on a lovely sunny day in the summer. Uh, what I also yeah. forgot to say is um, we've also got a lovely video from um, Johan Edwards um, on the website, which I forgot we still had. It was on the reserve page. Website. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's definitely worth the watch, isn't it? If you want to get a flavour of what it looks like being up there. Is it, it was done on a wet and windy day, that video, wasn't it? <laughs> I think it was, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, all right. I'll leave it all there, guys. I'll send you the link to the chat uh, to the talk via YouTube when I get it on in a couple of days. And then, like I said, if there's any other questions you've got, um, please just let us know or pop up to Kenyon. It's definitely worth a visit, isn't it, Chris? Yeah, yeah. All right, you take care, everyone. Have a nice evening. Cheers, Thank Chris. You, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Cheers, Mark. See you soon.